First speaker is Colin Boothroyd. He's recently been back in Mulu, where he, uh, he and Dave Nixon founded the new caving variant of Alcove Exploration, traveling 8,000 miles to climb the back end of, of Gunung Api to look in an entrance that turned out to be simply an alcove. Colin Boothroyd. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the world's biggest caves out in Mulu, which is quite a contrast to what you were uh, looking at this morning as uh, people from around the UK were trying to explain to you actually what, uh, what cave exploration was all about. Um, and we have a slightly different view on what cave exploration is about for us going out to, uh, to Mulu. So instead of actually lying in flat-out crawls and moving mud to one side or or sort of finding some, some bravado and lying in gravy and, and shivering, or in this case, waiting for your turn to move a few rocks to reveal yet more rocks. We have a different approach. <laughs> Straight to Heathrow. Don't pass go. Straight on the Piccadilly line, get to Heathrow. 18 hours later, you're getting off the plane on Sunkist Tarmac. And you're wandering from there into your five-star hotel room, you're dropping your bags, and then you're stepping onto the boardwalk. And uh, an hour later, you're here. You're at Deer Cave, one of the world's largest caves, literally 24 hours from where you are here, which is roughly the same time as it would take to get from here to Yorkshire, if you consider M25 and M1 and all the rest of it. So <clears throat> there you go. Deer Cave. So Deer Cave, as I say, it's a tourist cave. You can get to it along a boardwalk. Here you can see uh, we've got somebody standing there. You can see the, uh, the boardwalk making its way there. For many, many years, this was classified as the world's largest cave passage, and uh, it's been known by the local people for a long, long time. First discovered by uh, a British colonialist back in the, uh, the 60s and, and was the sort of the start to new development for uh, British cave expeditions over uh, subsequent years. So looking at, uh, at Deer Cave, this is looking out of the entrance of Deer Cave, and you can see some black dots at the top there. Those black dots are bats. And, uh, and here you can see the bats paying homage to uh, Abraham Lincoln before they, <clears throat> they gather together in clumps, in big sort of uh, clouds of, of bats, protecting themselves from the bat hawks that prey upon the stragglers. Um, and they make their way through the, uh, the air, across the forests, across the um, palm plantations, unfortunately now, uh, feeding through the night. Or... You can jump on a, uh, into a boat, a, a big sort of souped-up dugout canoe with an outboard on the back, and you can head up upriver, follow, following again a boardwalk, clambering up a load of boulders, and dropping into Clearwater Cave. This is another show cave that's been developed uh, in the last 20, 30 years. And if you're a good boy or girl, you can step over the, the balustrade at the end of the boardwalk, and you can explore probably one of the most spectacular river passages on the planet. This is the Clearwater River Passage. Um, and you can follow it for a number of kilometers <clears throat> in varying depths of water, knee deep up to, to waist deep, depending on the, uh, the, the conditions. Okay, so it, it hasn't always been like that, oddly enough. The, the five-star hotel and the planes and so forth weren't there when members of the Royal Geographical Society started putting their heads together 40 years ago, almost to the day, to plan an expedition with Malaysian counterparts to do a, a comprehensive survey of this particular part of the island of Borneo. As you can see here, we're looking at Malaysia in the top left-hand corner, the top part of the island, the lower part of the island is Kalimantan and part of uh, Indonesia. Back in those days, uh, we fly out to, uh, to Miri on the coast over here, and then take a boat upriver. One day up to Marudi, and then a further two days upriver as far as the edge of the mountainous area up the top there. Uh, and that's how it was when the 1978 expedition with all its scientists set off. Uh, it's a little bit different now. That's half an hour by plane. Uh, so the world has, has moved on. Okay, so to give it some perspective, you've got Gunong Mulu up at the top right there. Uh, Gunong Mulu is sandstone. There's no limestone there at all. Um, and, but uh, that's the, the place where most of the rain is captured. And that rain 
heads across to the left there and hits these limestone lumps. You've got the, the southern hills where Deer Cave is. You've got uh, Gunong Api. Uh, and further beyond the photograph, you've got Gunong Benarat and actually Gunong Buddha. Um, and that's where all the caves are hidden away. So this is going back to, to 1978. This is the, uh, the Royal Geographical Society expedition. 120 scientists, or number collectors as I prefer to call them, plus six speleologists, and five of whom are, are out of there. Okay, so they were on a mission to, to collect numbers, and um, they found over 2,500 different plants. Here you can see pitcher plants, insect-eating plants, and you've got these massive trees with buttress roots there to give the, uh, the trees some stability on a very sandy uh, alluvium floor. Uh, they found 81 different mammals, of which there were 26 species of bats, uh, and they also found that they got four species of cats, uh, including the clouded leopard and, the, um, and then, uh, uh, also the sun bear as well. Uh, massive range of reptiles and amphibians. 12,000 species of insects, various shapes and forms. <coughs> 281 species of butterfly, plus a few hang gliders. <coughs> and uh, 260 birds, including eight Hornbills, which are the sort of the, almost the emblem of Sarawak in northern um, northern Borneo. But it was these guys, the six cavers, who were uh, included in the expedition because they were aware that there were some caves in the limestone mountains, and uh, they needed some people who could uh, map them, survey them, photograph them, record them. Uh, and Dave Brooke, Tony Waltham, Andy Ebis, and a number of other people uh, were part of that team, uh, staying in the uh, the camp that they established, which is actually exactly where um, the uh, Marriott Hotel is nowadays. <clears throat> Their first and major, major expedition focus was trying to find out what was happening to the water, and they found out, well, they found the, uh, the clear water resurgence. And um, that led very quickly to a whole series of passages. Um, unfortunately, it choked, uh, sorry, sumped after um, two and a half, three kilometers, climbing up above the sump. Uh, they broke out into uh, what they later called the revival passage. This is evidence of really big high-level trunk roots where the water formally um, made its way. And um, these are original shots from, from those expeditions in the early days. <clears throat> lots of formations, lots of high-level stuff, lots of uh, sediment as well. But these guys actually had a bit of a blinder in terms of where they positioned themselves amongst the number collectors. They'd gone out there with an imperial tape measure, or a series of imperial tape measures, and they had metric graph paper. <laughs> one, of, one of their better ones. So it was simple, really. They, they took all their numbers and times them by 3.28, and that gave them 164,000 and I think it's 31 feet and 11 inches. Or, in our language, 50 kilometers of passage, they discovered. We've got a young Andy Ebis and Ben Lyon. <clears throat> they put together an idea <laughs> that they should have another expedition just with cavers. <clears throat> So Andy and Ben pulled together a, um, <clears throat> a team of fine young men and women <clears throat> who were focused on, uh, on just looking at caves. And um, here you can see where we're all sitting. So this, this area here is Gunon Mulu, the sandstones. You can see the rivers making their way down to the, the blue limestone sections here. And to the, the west through here, these are the alluvial plains and some shales over here, but basically this is all alluvium that's been carried off Mulu, either through the gorges or through the caves, and is sort of spread out on the, uh, the western flanks there. Um, here you can see Clearwater Cave, Camp 5, which is in the Melanau Gorge. That was part of the uh, IGS uh, camps. Um, and uh, the objectives from 1980 onwards have really been focusing on Gunong Api and Gunong Benarat to see what happens to the water that falls upon them. Okay, so we've got, um, we've got these three sort of terrains. We've got the, the, uh, the sandstone, which is very high and, uh, and difficult to cover. We've got the limestone, which is really a walk in the park, as you can see. 
this is what the limestone looks like uh, in its various forms. It really is extremely difficult terrain to, to cover. It's all pinnacle cast. Some of it goes up to 30 meters high. Other is uh, a, a bit lower. But uh, it's very, very difficult terrain to, to cover. So the best way of, of finding caves in Mulu, if you can, is to start on the alluvial plain um, and, uh, and hunt from them from the peripheral edge along the west. Uh, but there's a catch there as well. Of course, we've got forest. Uh, and this is a tropical rainforest. And it has a a habit of wetting itself on a regular basis, as in daily. And so this is a very difficult terrain uh, in that sense, and that uh, you can get to quite nice dry conditions, and then very, very quickly it turns to, to knee-deep um, swampy waters. And these little rascals, they love that warm and wet, <clears throat> and they hang from the, uh, the leaves, the leeches, and they're looking for warm blood. Uh, and they're particularly happy when there's a bit of rain and there's a mammal walks past. And <clears throat> what they're looking for is something that they can dig their, their feet into, their suckers into, and they start sucking blood. Uh, and they're only really happy when they're completely filled and they, uh, they drop off, uh, leaving um, some little scars like this. Not particularly painful, but quite unsightly. And they, uh, they're not fussy as to where they choose. Warm and wet is all it's important for. Um, what's interesting here isn't actually the grubs. It's what they're, they're feeding upon, the black stuff. That's guano. Bat guano or bird guano. Poo to you and me. The guano emits a smell, a sort of a, a sweet ammonia smell. <clears throat> the guano, of course, is in the caves where the bats live. So the guano builds up in big beds in the caves. We've got a draft coming through the cave. That draft picks up this ammonia smell and throws it out on the surface. And then that smell then tumbles down the flanks of the limestone. And the cavers walking along the alluvial plain are smelling for the guano smell. And when you get it, that's the point when you really fight your way through the forest and then try and follow the smell to find the caves. And so many of the, the caves that have been found in Appy have actually been found with the benefit of smell. But it's not just the, uh, the bats that live in the cave, we've got birds. <clears throat> we've got birds that, uh, that fly through the caves. These are swiftlets. And they're flying through the caves to get to where they were originally born, where they, their nests are. And so they're, they're flying through the caves to well, very remote parts, literally kilometers. And they're using a, um, an audible clicking sound, sort of an echolocation sound, to be able to, to see in inverted commas as they make their way through, through the passages. Quite, quite incredible. <clears throat> uh, and then, then they nest in these little niches here. You can see around the edge here that sort of salivary coating. That coating there, believe it or not, is very interesting to the to certain sectors of the Chinese population who use it for making bird's nest soup. Um, and uh, it's quite a, a delicacy, and that proves to be quite an interesting thing for the local people to gather. In addition to uh, the, the bird's nesters who are collecting some of these nests, they have another predator, a cave racer, snakes. The snakes live in the caves, and they're very interested in these swiftlets. Uh, they wrap themselves around stalactites or stalagmites or boulders, waiting in sections of cave passage that have a relatively small cross-section where the highest density of birds are flying through, um, and they can literally grab the birds out of, out of the air. They're using some kind of infrared heat-sensing um, mechanism to do that. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so going back to, to 1980, that first group... Um, we, uh, we were focusing on many areas, but uh, one of the things that we found was putting some dye into some water right up in the, the headwaters, dropped it down, and didn't, put, didn't resurge at clear water, as we'd anticipated, but actually resurged further over to the east. And um, a group of, uh, of cavers followed that river up to the east, and lo and behold, it came out of a hole in the ground. And this is that very hole. It was a canal <clears throat> that they followed for about half a kilometer, into a sort of a large cascading section full of boulders, big rifts, and so forth. Uh, some lovely uh, sections with plunge pools traversed round. Another massive boulder slope, and then bang, the biggest chamber on the planet. This is uh, Sarawak Chamber, 
bigger than the two previously known biggest chambers at the time. Uh, absolutely massive, 700 meters by 400 meters of that order. Uh, but it's not a beautiful place. It's boulders. It's boulders and boulders and more boulders. When you're in there, it's a bit like bumbling around on the side of Great Gable in the dark. You know, there's got no bearing at all, and there's not much sense in it either. Uh, there are three stalagmites in the whole chamber, uh, <laughs> half a meter high. That's it. <clears throat> this is the original survey. <clears throat> And just to give you some kind of feeling of scale, <clears throat> here we are. You can see us at uh, the Royal Geographical Society. Just adjacent to us on the left there, we've got the Royal Albert Hall. This is Deer Cave to the same scale. And this is Sarawak Chamber. You can get 35 Albert Halls inside Sarawak Chamber. That just gives you a feel for the overall size of this place. Okay, just to give it some uh, kind of bearing as to where we are, we've got um, the Deer Cave Massif down here. This is a little limestone thing here with one of the world's largest cave passages in it, a number of other cave passages. We've got an airstrip down here. We've got the uh, Hilton Hotel, somewhere, sorry, the Marriott Hotel over here. We've got Gunon Appy here with Sarawak Chamber squeezed into the corner over there. Uh, Gunon Benrat, Gunon Buddha over there and Mulu bringing all the waters down into it, and a valley through here that we call Hidden Valley. This little dot here, that's Clearwater Cave. That's the resurgence of Clearwater Cave, and that's been the, the focus, really, of, of many of the expeditions over the years, because we've got 10 kilometers going from Clearwater Cave right to Melanau Gorge here, where some of the water sinks, uh, and exploring the cave, or what we believe to be the cave, through here has been the focus of a number of expeditions over the last um, 30 years. So the nicest, well, no, it's not the nicest at all. This is um, how we started. We established uh, camps in the forest, uh, big nylon tarpaulin roofs. And really, they were um, insect feeding and sort of mud wallowing environments, really not, not very nice. Uh, but that was, that was base camp. That's where we would, uh, we, was, we would sit and focus and try and find high-level entrances that would take us into clear water so that we could then try and follow it basically northwards. That was always the target. And this is a series of shots of some of the nice passages that we've got in the upper series of clear water. So it's just a series of, uh, of nice photographs. <coughs> Okay, so around about 2000, we sort of rumbled to the fact that actually it wasn't so clever being on the alluvial plain under plastic tarpaulins. Uh, we started gravitating to entrances that we could find in the limestone. And uh, for most of the recent expeditions, we've either been basing ourselves in the National Park headquarters or in the canopies of some of the caves on the flanks of, of Gunong Api. More recently, as the caves have become longer and longer, camping underground, and bibbing underground is by far the most popular and the most comfortable way of doing it. Uh, you've got a totally stable environment underground, and, uh, and it's really very peaceful, and you don't have too many beasties. High levels, so we're up in the high levels now. We're trying to find the route above Clearwater River, heading north as best we can, climbing up Avons, squeezing and thrutching between boulders and lots of boulder chokes and sediment chokes. Um, this is the nearest you can come to Yorkshire caving in Mulu. It's 20 meters above me and 20 meters below me, but I'm crawling, so I'm a happy little Colin. But uh, sediment banks and uh, the collapsing nature of them are uh, what makes Mulu caves really quite special and actually really quite difficult. None of these big tunnels are really railway tunnels in the sense that you're up and down over sediment banks all the time. Here we've got probably the world's silliest Y hang. <coughs> That's a Y hang. <laughs> and the reason it's like it is, is that everything you see there is sediment. It's just loose, crumbly silt and boulders and sand. And uh, when we were faced with this big pit for which we could see a, a passage down below, uh, there was nothing we could put anchors onto at all. So we had to set it up in this fashion, a big, big uh, Y hang. <clears throat> 
We dropped down a series of pictures, and then we came to this big passage here. A fantastic passage we call Firecracker, uh, and this headed north, three kilometers, as straight as they come. Uh, unfortunately, ending at a, uh, a sump, but it was taking us up through the mountain. Uh, climbing up, once again, up into the high-level passages, breaking out into big boulder collapse uh, zones, uh, giving us the opportunity to, to head north. And that was where we are. We've got the Clearwater Cave resurgence down here somewhere, and uh, all these passages all interconnecting uh, to create the, uh, the system that we, we've got by the end of about 2000. But life continues. Um, we've had expeditions almost every year since then, and we've been focusing on really trying to find out what's happening to the water. We know the water sinks, or some of it sinks, in Melanau Gorge. Uh, we've seen it down at, the research, at uh, a point halfway through the mountain down there. We want to try and find out where it's all coming from. So White Rock Cave. White Rock Cave was found uh, about 15, 16 years ago uh, by some surface prospectors, and, um, and that was our new route into the heart of Appy, and uh, it's named for a good reason. You can see there's a nice white appearance to the passages. Once again, massive sweeping passages, big sediment banks in various places, all very, very um, Mulu-esque, but also some quite nice smaller pretties, um, various uh, crystal formations, little helictites of various forms. Life in the caves, there's quite a lot of life in the caves, but I'm not really going to cover it. This is just an example of a, uh, a crab that's completely cave adapted, no eyes. It's, uh, it's shell, totally transparent, no need for pigment in it. Uh, we get uh, scorpions. It's about, it's about half a meter. No, it's about, probably about a meter in length, that scorpion. Um, <coughs> uh, and... Uh, <coughs> You get pizzas. Occasionally you get a pizza slapped on the wall. This is a pizza with the cheese dripping off it. Um, you, get, um, you get this thing. And this is something that we, we really haven't sorted out yet. But what you're looking at here, as you can see, we've got three stalagmites. It's about a meter and a half in height. From the top down to there, you're about a meter. You can see that line through there. All that is calcite. Everything down here is bedrock. And it's cleanly bedrock. You can see it it's here as well. These are bedrock stalagmites. Calcite bedrock. It's a continuous line. You can even see some little grooves on the side here that run from the calcite into the, the bedrock. To date, nobody's come up with a good explanation as to what that's all about. Prehistoric man and some handprints. Uh, <coughs> Anyway, White Rock Cave, following White Rock Cave, heading north as best we can. We're trying to get out to the Melanau Gorge in the north. We found a route down through boulders, ab down into a stream passage. We were back at Clearwater River. We're right at the very northern, northern end of, of Appy here, uh, but we're back down in the Clearwater River. Somewhat smaller than the Clearwater River down by the resurgence, of course but nonetheless, nonetheless, very distinctly, the same animal. But, lo and behold, you're following it eventually to a sump, uh, completely choked, completely closed down sump, um, and, uh, and that was the end of the route with Clearwater River. Uh, it's yet to be looked at with our divers. <clears throat> but, of course, everyone was keen to find a way on, and uh, a lot of work's been done trying to find high-level alternatives to bypass the sump to see if we can pop out at the top of the mountain. Um, and this is where we are in, in simple terms. We've got Camp 5 here, and this is where we are inside the mountain. We're, we're about 30 to 50 meters beyond that sort of tree line there. Camp 5, so recent expeditions have all been based in Camp 5, either working in White Rock Cave or focusing on trying to find a, uh, an entrance going out of the Melanau Gorge and, uh, and picking up on the, um, the, the very northern end of Clearwater. So uh, it's been the digging brigade have been clambering and climbing and squeezing and, uh, and using chisels and everything to try and, try and make their way through 
uh, uh, cave entrances at the, uh, the top end, but to no avail. To date, uh, no one has managed to connect the very northern tip of, um, of Clearwater through to, um, to the Melanau Gorge. This shows you the, uh, how close we've actually got. You can see the, uh, the cliff line here. The actual river passage is below the cliff line, it's below the alluvial plain. But this is the high level passages, this is where we're hoping to try and find a route to pop out. But to be honest, there's no draft, there's no birds. Uh, there's gonna be some work to be done to, uh, to, to make that connection from these passages. <coughs> Okay, and uh, once again, to try and put things in perspective, <clears throat> where we are, mm -hmm. you can see um, the RGS uh, down on the left there, and, uh, and here we are with the Clearwater Cave system, uh, sort of a, a bit of an alternative to Crossrail, really. It's... Um... <clears throat> okay, um, so <clears throat> that takes us pretty well up to, up to date. You can see... <clears throat> Uh, all these caves here, that's the, the whole of the Clearwater cave system there. There's 227 kilometers of interconnected cave passage there. Then you've got Sarawak Chamber over here, you've got Cobra Cave and a number of other caves there. But the thing that's sort of staring you in the face is that there's a big zone here with no squiggles on it. It's limestone, but no known caves other than Little Wonder Cave down here. And that was the target uh, this year. A team of eight of us went out uh, to see if we can put some squiggles on the blue map. And um, we didn't mess around. We, uh, we went in by helicopter into Hidden Valley. And uh, camping under the, uh, the canopy of Prediction Cave, one of the caves that have been known for a long time, making that our base. And then trying to push the Wonder Cave system as far as we possibly could. Uh, and we, we're benefiting now from far better technology than they had when they first found these caves back in the late 70s. Uh, we've got battery drills, climbing avens, um, and, uh, and really good lights that are picking out features that, um, that are helping us. A uh, team of eight of us explored 12 and a half kilometers of passage in, uh, in that corner of the northeastern corner of Appy uh, early on this year. Once again, more classic sort of Mulu formations, Mulu, Mulu passage, passage esque sized stuff. Eventually, unfortunately, finishing at uh, mud chokes and uh, avens that uh, were sort of nipping in um, and fairly minimal draft, to be honest, uh, but nonetheless a very interesting location. And you can see here passages that really fill up quite seriously when it's rain, when it's wet, uh, with one or two little air bells that uh, remain, remain clean. This was an interesting discovery. We turned the, turned the corner in this, this big sort of keyhole-esque type passage, and um, we're faced by, by this thing. This isn't a, a Photoshop scratch. This is a real straw. This is a straw stalactite. It's all by itself. There's no others. It's just hanging there all by itself in the middle of the passage. And we measured it. It's 9.12 meters in length. It's the world's longest straw. But the question is why? Why is it there? But why hasn't the rascal fallen down under its own weight? And nobody knows as yet. There's lots of people in the speleothem world looking at it and thinking as to why it may be where it is. But yeah, 9.12 meters. That's the team. <clears throat> and that's where we are with uh, all the caves and the, their lengths. Just gives some perspective as to, to what we've got. And as you can see, that's the, what we added in March. So we're now starting to fill this top right-hand quadrant of the map with some squiggles. That's 12 and a half kilometers of, of squiggle. Uh, OK. <clears throat> Um, kind of just to finish off with just looking at one little thought as to why the Mulu Caves are so big, and I think maybe Pete and others will be covering it uh, tomorrow, but um, they are massive. They are absolutely massive, and it, it's fairly obvious that the water has something to do with it and the rocks have got something to do with it. They form these big cave passages, uh, but why are they as big as they are? Why are we looking at lots and lots of boulders? Well, here you can see Clearwater River Passage. You can see this massive limestone here. There's one or two stains coming down, but this is really massive limestone. 
Whilst over here, we've got cracks galore. Absolutely broken up with cracks, but you don't see them at all in the main limestone. And there's a solid theory that what's happening is that the caves are formed, either completely underwater or with a Vedo's incision that's driving them away, and they're leaving behind big cavities, and they're leaving behind, and they're following a different route and then leaving them high and dry. So these big cavities are, uh, are just sort of sat there, and they're succumbing to massive bearing pressure. I mean, we are talking an awful lot of limestone coming down from above. And this bearing pressure has to be dissipated somehow. And it hasn't got, because it's massive limestone, we haven't got all the, the joints and the cracks and so forth to lose it in. It's going straight into this big cavity that's, that's been formed. And that, that bearing pressure creates weaknesses in the, in the walls. Force is coming down, it cracks the walls. The walls then start falling off. So the walls are falling down in boulders. They're landing on the floor. The water, the drips are sort of dissolving them and carrying them away. <clears throat> and then the roof finds that it can no longer support its own weight because it hasn't got the walls. So the, the roof is then collapsing down as well. And, um, and here you can see an example of a fairly recent collapse. This hasn't been washed away. Uh, of, of roof that's just simply just dropped out. And it hasn't dropped out because there's lots of natural bedding weaknesses in the massive limestone. It's a consequence of all these forces. So that's one little theory as to, to why we've got these massive, massive passages in Mulu. Uh, and I'm sure there are other people who will be able to uh, add more as to why they're formed in the way they are. 23 British-led caving expeditions since 1978, and there are more on the horizon. So, <clears throat> Mulu is very much for, for everyone. It really is uh, for those who want to go along and jump on the plane and walk along the boardwalk or join the expeditions. Uh, it's for you, whether you're young and stupid <clears throat> or old and decrepit. <laughs> it's for you. And uh, that's the end of my show. If you want more information, you can find it from the mulucaves.org uh, website, or you can speak to Dick or Andy or any of the old Mulu pensioners who can advise you which direction to head. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.